In the spring of 1915, patriotism is on parade. And the University of Toronto is at war. The campus will soon be a training center for the British Royal Flying Corps. There's a rifle range in the unfinished Hart House Theater. As a grim reminder of what lies ahead, Lieutenant Lauren Harris paints the walls to resemble a shell-torn Belgian village. 20-year-old Con Smythe doesn't mind the sound of gunfire. Short and scrappy, he's never been one to back away from a fight. As captain of the university hockey team, Smythe has just won the Ontario Junior Championship in front of four and a half thousand fans. Now, he's spoiling for action. We'd been talking about it for weeks. The following Monday, nine of us from the hockey team went down to join up two artillery outfits that were recruiting. By the end of the day, I was Gunner C. Smythe, 25th Battery, Canadian Field Artillery. The First World War is the bloody triumph and tragedy of a generation. As Canada grows into nationhood, hockey comes of age. From the ruins of Europe, our game is celebrated as the best in the world. The war changes women in society and in hockey. The NHL is born, and the game expands as never before. Empires are built, and a legend in blue rises out of Toronto as the sounds of hockey sweep across the land. As the doomed youth of a generation march in the mud of Flanders, the national passion is eclipsed by a sense of national duty. Canada needs soldiers. Recruiter and hockey veteran Captain James Sutherland urges hockey players to swap their team colors for khaki. With every man doing his bit, Canada will raise an army of brain and brawn from our hockey enthusiasts, the likes of which the world has never seen. The bell has rung. Let every man play the greatest game of his life. There wasn't a sense of how horrible this war would be. It was an adventure. It was a great adventure. It was you and your chums side by side fighting against an enemy. I mean, bigger and better than any sports match could be. How, how could you resist it? In Stratford, Ontario, 16-year-old Howie Morenz is instantly hooked. And when he disappears, his family assumes, as always, he's off to play hockey. His sister Gertrude remembers the day he didn't come home. Mother became alarmed and started a search for him. All the neighbors helped us comb Stratford thoroughly and mother became frantic. Howie had slipped out of Stratford, lied about his age, and enlisted with the Governor General's horse guards. His mother storms the recruiting office, waving Howie's birth certificate, and his military career is over. Mrs. Morenz had hoped Howie might stay in school or learn a trade. But fate has a different destiny for the kid the hockey world would one day know as the Stratford Streak. Back in Toronto, Lieutenant Constantine Smythe fits perfectly into the army. He thrives in a world where orders are given and decisions taken. 
Somebody asked me once whether soldiers talked much about fear of being wounded or killed. I never heard that during World War I. It was always the fear that we wouldn't get there. Smythe joins an artillery battalion, nicknamed the Sportsman's Battery, because it has 10 of the best hockey players in Ontario. A few days before they ship out, Smythe arranges a game against the Toronto Argos in the old Mutual Arena. As coach, he places a $3,000 bet and makes a rousing speech to his players. I stood up in front of the team and told them, every nickel this hockey team had in the world was riding on this game. Motivated, if not inspired, the sportsman's battery wins the game and the bet and boards the troop ship $7,000 richer. Smythe keeps a share of the winnings to buy a lavish dinner for the battery every Christmas until the end of the war. As the fighting drags on, every year there are more empty chairs at the Christmas table. Lieutenant Monty Clarkson. Lieutenant Meyer Cohen. Governor Jack Pethick. By 1917, every senior officer in the sportsman's battery is dead or wounded. but not Lieutenant Con Smythe. Sergeant Major Norm Harvey. I began to notice I was chronically lucky. I would tell people I got a nudge from the man upstairs. Maybe some thought I was kidding, but five times I lived unscathed when death or maiming was a better than 50-50 chance. Each time it was luck, not guts or planning or intelligence on my part. In 1917, Smythe quits the muck of the trenches to don the clean battle dress of the Royal Flying Corps. He earns his wings and goes back to war as an aerial artillery spotter. The last day I flew, the clouds were low, less than 2,000 feet. I shouldn't have been sent up in that weather. Or I should have had enough sense to fake it, and then come back and say, great shooting. Flying low behind the German lines, his plane is hit by ground fire, and Smythe crashes in no man's land. He's listed as missing in action. For his family back home, that's the cruel code for almost certainly dead. They wait for the knock on the door that means Khan's luck has finally run out. In 1915, women are not even recognized as persons under Canadian law. They still can't vote and make half of what a man earns. But the necessities of war have pulled women into the workforce as never before. Across the country, women are taking over the jobs left vacant by men. And the factory workers, shop clerks, and secretaries who work together start playing together. With so many hockey players and their fans on the battlefields of France, the arenas are struggling. So poor is the quality of the men's game that the Montreal Wanderers offer free tickets to wounded servicemen and their families. Even that doesn't draw a crowd. Oh, oh. 
but women's hockey finds an audience hungry for their game. For the first time in history, women are paid to play hockey. It's entertaining, it's rough, and the sports press has something new to write about. Casualties were heavy. Miss Hill of North End Stanley received a stick across the face. Miss Albert of Telegraph gained a black eye. It was real hockey, and the checking was close and cruel, and caused numerous thumps on the ice of the sort that make the hairpins jump out. All of a sudden, the women's game gets serious attention. There's the obvious novelty aspect of it, of girls playing this man sport. But lo and behold, there's another novelty aspect of it once it begins. They're good at it. In every town, there are local heroes, just as there had been in the men's game. Right winger Tenna Turner is the star forward for the Westboro Pets. Young Eva Alt is a fan favorite of the Ottawa Alerts. But there are none who can skate like Albertine La Pensée, the miracle made from Cornwall, Ontario. She's a 26-year-old sniper who's become the darling of the sports press. It is probable that the match will attract the largest crowd that has ever witnessed a girls game in Ottawa. Miss Albertine La Ponce will be the center of attention when the Cornwall team skates out. The gallant little lady has gained fame as the queen of all lady hockeyists. She scored 15 goals in a recent game. Cornwall's main competition is the Westerns of Montreal, and their coach, Len Porteous, is desperate to find a player that can beat Albertine. First, he recruits Agnes Vautier, a left winger from Montreal. They call her the female Nuzi Lalonde. She's quick, and she can score. But she's no match for the Miracle Maid. Coach Porteous spends days on the road, scouting every small rink in the Quebec countryside. And in the village of Woodlands, outside of Chateau Gay, he finds his ringer. He discovered a young girl by the name of Edda Lalonde, who is a hockey prodigy. Only 17 years old, this girl marveled all those who saw her play. And each one proclaimed her La Pensée's rival. But on the eve of her first game, Ada gets cold feet. It's not the competition that worries her. It's her little secret. Ada wears a jock strap. Ada Lalone of Woodlands confessed to the manager of the Westerns that he was simply a boy disguised as a girl because he wanted to play against Miss La Pensée. The young boy dressed in bloomers and a jersey top definitely looked like a girl and even fooled Lan Porteous during the first practice. And so if you're a young boy who's got hockey talent and you can't play in any decent league or you're not old enough to go to war, then why not dress as a woman and try your hand at it until they find you out? At least you'll get paid for your efforts. Women's hockey is so popular, promoters put up money to stage a series of exhibition games in the United States. The Montreal Star declares it degrading, apparently just one step removed from the oldest profession. Young ladies going on these sorts of trips put themselves in competition with professional actresses, burlesque performers, and vaudeville, and are expected to be treated as such. A lot of the press were 
not so much against women playing hockey as they were against women traveling and playing hockey. And of course, there was always the economic element. Can we make some money at this game? They were betting on women's hockey games uh, way back then. And also there was that marvelous sense of, of the burlesque of the, uh, it's kind of like female mud wrestling. It is the first golden era of women's hockey. And for two glorious years, it lives in the spotlight. But with the end of World War I, comes the end of the craze. And the game's brightest light, Albertine La Ponce, simply disappears. She was so stellar and shone so brightly and then vanishes in 1917, gone, and no one knows where. And then that opens up the gap for rumor. And the most fanciful and maybe true rumor is that she's gone to the United States, had a sex change operation, come back home to Canada and lives quietly as a gas station operator under the name Albert Smith. Just who was Albertine La Ponce and how did she vanish? Nearly a century later, mystery still surrounds one of the greatest players in the history of women's hockey. In 1919, Canadian soldiers are coming back from the war, coming back to a changed country. When the train pulls into Toronto's Rosedale station, it brings Con Smythe back from the dead. After crashing in no man's land, he'd spent 14 months in a prisoner of war camp. Four years of my life were gone that I would never get back. I was 24 and hadn't done a thing yet, but I was going to make up for it. Of that, I was damn sure. Opportunity is on the horizon, and Smythe will take it with both hands. But the doors don't open so easily for everyone. In Winnipeg, Frank Fredrickson and his friends are also returning veterans but they're first-generation Icelandic Canadians. The locals call them ghoulies, second-class citizens. Before the war, Fredrickson was a top-notch hockey player with the Falcons. They had trouble getting ice time then, and nothing has changed now. We found that the reason we couldn't get into the senior league was because the players were from well-to-do families and wanted no part of us. But they couldn't quite get away from us that easily. They've shown in the war that they are fine citizens, but the war's over. We want the world to go back the way it was, and in Winnipeg, that means white Anglo-Saxon Protestants call the shots, and Lutheran Icelanders do not. And so once again, they're barred from the top leagues in, in Winnipeg and have to find somewhere else to play. But the Falcons will get their chance in 1920. Hockey's popularity is growing in Europe, and for the first time, it will be played at the Olympic Games in Antwerp, Belgium. Canada will send the winners of the Allen Cup, awarded to the country's best amateur team. And the Falcons intend to be that team. More than 8,000 fans line up to see them play the University of Toronto in the Cup Final. Back in Winnipeg, the Free Press is running a special Allen Cup bulletin service, calling the play-by-play -play to hundreds of fans gathered on the street. The Icelanders displayed more class than has been seen on the Toronto arena this year. The performance of the Westerns was a revelation to the Eastern bugs and their wonderful speed and puck carrying had the immense crowd gasping with amazement. 
The Falcons win three to two, and suddenly they're heroes. No more will they hear that unholy name, Ghoulies. It will be Hello Canada and Bonjour Canadiens. The team is fully able to represent the athletic manhood of the Great Dominion. With a set of new clothes, the Falcons catch the first boat to Europe. In 1920, Belgium is still digging out of the rubble of the Great War. But in the city of Antwerp, the ice rink is still standing, and the Palais de Glace is like nothing the Canadian boys had ever seen before. Sports editor and hockey czar, Bill Hewitt, reports on the Falcons for the readers back home. Chairs and tables remained on elevations on the other side and spectators dined and drank as they watched the various nations play hockey. A really good orchestra played tirelessly from early morning until late at night. A suitable surrounding for the genteel sport that is European hockey. Monsieur Savoie of the Swiss team tends the net wearing a smart cardigan with white shirt and tie. He lets in 29 goals in his first outing. Frank Fredrickson and the Canadians are in way under their heads. All through the tournament, we tried to limit ourselves to 14 or 15 goals a game against the European teams. Believe me, it was difficult, but we managed to stay within reasonable bounds. The truth is, They've reinvented hockey. The game the Canadians play is faster and more skillful, rougher too. For the Europeans, it's like a game they once knew, but now it's running on high octane. The Falcons romp through the tournament. In the gold medal game, they meet the Swedes. They were without a doubt the best of the European teams. Very friendly fellows, and we liked them a lot. As a gesture of goodwill, the Falcons deliberately trip up and give the Swedes a break. They let them score a single goal. I guess it's safe to confess that we gave it to them. The Swedes went wild. They were yelling and cheering, shaking hands with themselves, shaking hands with us. It was great. But that was all the Swedes would get. The Falcons win the game 12 to one. The team that couldn't find a game at home wins the first Olympic gold medal ever awarded for hockey. Defenseman Alan Woodman writes home. Dear Mother, since you last heard from me, I have become one of the world's champion hockey players, and his royal nibs, Prince Albert, is going to give me a gold medal and a signed diploma confirming my ability as a hockey player. You see, Mother, I really am coming along very nicely in this old world. In addition to just selling the image of Canada as a hockey nation, they literally sold the game of hockey as a Canadian idea that the legacy of the Falcons isn't so much that they won the first gold medal, but that they were great Canadian ambassadors of hockey in Europe. Back home, they're celebrated like conquering heroes. The Winnipeg Falcons had played the game on a world stage and confirmed Canada as the first nation of hockey.
Howie Morenz may have been saved from the trenches by his mom, but even she can't keep him in school. At 17, Howie quits to go work in the Stratford Railway Yards. But he lives for hockey. He's the star in Stratford, sometimes playing on three different teams. And when he's caught sleeping at work, no one seems to mind because Howie Morenz is the Stratford streak. News of the hockey marvel reaches the desk of Leo Dandurand in Montreal. He and his partners are sportsmen and gamblers. They own racetracks and bookie joints, and they've just bought the Montreal Canadiens for $11,000. When Dandurand signs Howie Morenz to a contract in 1923, he thinks he's just made the deal of his life. But a month later, he gets a surprise in the mail. Dear sir, owing to several reasons, I find it impossible to leave Stratford. I'm sorry if I've caused you expense and inconvenience and trust you will accept the return contract in a sportsmanlike way. Yours truly, Howard Morenz. Dan Durand confronts his young protege at a face-to-face -face meeting in Montreal. Alone and far from home, the small town kid breaks down. I'm too light and the league is too tough. I don't believe I'm good enough to make a place on your team. And you will be everlastingly sorry you forced me into pro hockey. You'll have to take the responsibility of depriving me from my livelihood and my amateur standing. My whole life will be ruined. Dan Durant sends Howie home with a piece of advice. Half encouragement, half threat. Remember, I am confident you will make good in the NHL, and I expect you to report to our training camp on the 15th of November. Morenz swallows his fears and shows up at camp. He plays on the top line with the speedy Billy Boucher on right wing. On his left is the little giant, Aurel Joliat. It's the next generation of the flying Frenchman. Minding the net is the Iceman, the six-foot Shakutami cucumber, Georges Vesna. After the first practice, Vesna tells Dan Durand, the kid's gonna be a star. Howie was a skater. He was the kind of guy who could go around defensemen, make them look like a pylon. He's in the tradition of Rocket Richard. He's in the tradition of Guy Lafleur, in the tradition of Yvon Cornoyer. And the true measure of it is that people who went to see hockey games, who'd never seen a hockey game before, the name they always remember coming out of the arena, having seen their first game, was Howie. He was the guy they always noticed. Dan Duran now has a powerhouse team in a rinky-dink league. The NHL consists of just four shaky teams in Ottawa, Toronto, Hamilton, and Montreal. To survive, it must look south of the border. The 1920s are the golden age of sport in the United States. Huge new arenas are rising in Boston and New York. There are markets and millionaires to be exploited. And Leo Dandran knows how to sell the game. He and the NHL need a buyer, and they target Tex Rickard. Rickard is Jack Dempsey's manager, the man who made the first million dollar gate and the driving force behind the new Madison Square Garden in New York. When Tex Rickard comes up to Montreal for an evening of drinks and a little Canadian-style hockey, it's Leo Dandurand's flying Frenchman he's here to see. The forum is packed for the Canadian's game.
Rickard can't take his eyes off Howie Morenz. He sees the screaming fans and the power of the game. And he's sold. Rickard promises to put ice in Madison Square Garden on the condition that Howie Morenz and the Flying Frenchman are there for the opener. Hockey needed a superstar. I mean, anybody could fight, but they also needed people to, to bring people out of their seats. And remember, this is the age of American sport, of, of Babe Ruth and Bill Tilden and Red Grange and, and, and superstars, people who were bigger than the sport. And hockey needed to have that one kind of a player to, to really make a penetration into the American market if you're going to sell. December 15th, 1925. Opening night in Madison Square Garden. There's a fresh sheet of ice and a new team, the New York Americans, waiting for the Canadians. It's a gala international affair. The Governor General's Royal Foot Guards Band performs for the first time outside Canada. To help New Yorkers understand the game, the Times publishes the hockey rules two days before the game. The beautiful people from Broadway to Wall Street show up at the opening. There was a buzz from one end of Manhattan, indeed through all the boroughs. This was going to be the most exciting thing that had ever happened hit New York. There was going to be speed. There was going to be violence. I remember the great story about him always parking a couple of ambulances in front of Madison Square Garden before the game. Sort of a, there's going to be bloodshed here. Tex Rickard understood how to put something on Broadway and how to play it up big. As the teams line up on the ice, WJY Radio begins its hockey broadcast. This is Major J. Andrew White speaking to you from the beautiful new Madison Square Garden. It's going to be a magnificent... The New York Americans are a sea of color, covered in red stripes and white stars. Canadians left winger Aurel Joliet is charmed. What a surprise to see the Americans in those uniforms. They looked like they'd come right out of a circus. We didn't know whether to play hockey against them or ask them to dance. It was New York not only against Canada, it was New York against those marvelous flying Frenchmen who themselves brought this aura of exotic to New York. All that survives of the game itself is a few minutes of grainy black and white footage and the score. Canadians win three to two. But the spectacle leaves a lasting legacy. Hockey is a hit. And Howie Morenz shows New York the poetry of the game. It's like ballet on ice. It really is. If you understand how graceful ballet is, the sport of hockey is like that all the way back to the 20s. You got to be able to skate. And so, we combine that with a competitive side and we combine it with a physical aspect, but it's ballet on ice, it's something special. By the end of the 20s, the NHL has grabbed a toehold in the richest market in the world. There are hockey teams in Boston, Chicago, New York, and Pittsburgh. And as the game grows in the United States, a legend in blue is rising in Toronto. In 1923, the upright city of Toronto is finally having fun. Over at Shea's Theatre, people line up for the latest from Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd. You could dance the night away with Luigi Romanelli and the King Edward Hotel Radio Syncopators.
over at the CNE, you can go for a ride on the Midway. Or gawk at the human oddities of Johnny J. Jones. The 1920s sees Toronto construct the tallest building in the British Empire, open the largest hotel, and unveil a grand train station. It's a building boom, and Con Smythe is in the thick of it. The man who believes in luck also believes there's no substitute for hard work. By 1925, Smythe has a successful sand and gravel business supplying building sites all over the city. But he's never far from hockey. On weekends and evenings, he'll take any job, referee, gold judge, scorekeeper, or coach. Word spreads that Smythe is a gifted manager with an eye for talent. It lands him a big time job, head coach of the NHL's newest franchise, the New York Rangers. It seems like an ideal fit, but Con Smythe's ambitions are too big, even for New York. Con Smythe behaved in a way that he owned the team, and that, that does not tend to go over very well with hockey owners, never has. Con Smythe didn't know his place and didn't want to know his place, so he was shown the door very quickly. He disagreed with hockey management about everything. The Rangers give him $2,500 to get out of town. That afternoon, he bets the lot on a football game in Montreal and doubles his money. That night, he doubles it again on a hockey game in Toronto. Just like that, he's up $10,000. And now that he's got the cash, he's looking for revenge. Three months later, he gets his chance when he's asked to coach the worst team in the NHL, the Toronto St. Pats. I said I'd only run the team if I could buy it, or part of it. I was only 32, but thinking small was never one of my failings. Smythe puts down his winnings, rounds up some investors, but still comes up short. He goes to the sellers and he says, look, this is all we've got, and they basically tell him to take a hike. And Con, not for the last time in pro sports, goes and says, you gentlemen live here in Toronto, don't you? How would you like being the people who walk down the street and people point at you and say, you're the ones who sent our hockey team to Philadelphia or Pittsburgh? And that shuts them up. They take the lesser money. Not for the last time in hockey do they play the civic card and get away with it. The instant the ownership papers are signed, Smythe starts the makeover. He finds the St. Pat's name too Catholic and their green and white colors too Irish. By the start of the 1928 season, the team has a new name and a new look. I had a feeling that the new Maple Leaf name was right. Our Olympic team in 1924 had worn Maple Leaf crests on their chests. I had worn it on insignias and badges during the war. I thought it meant something across Canada. Smythe has big dreams for himself and his team. He wants to be rich, and he wants the Stanley Cup. Con Smythe is a tough, tough, determined guy. He sets up the New York Rangers for Tex Rickard, buys all the players, and then on the eve of the season is fired. I mean, this is a guy who has the alpha personality and the chip on his shoulder the size of PEI. And when those two things come together, the Maple Leafs had to be a success. In the spring of 1930, with Canada in the depths of the Great Depression, Smythe does the unthinkable. At a time when building even a hot dog stand seems foolish, Smythe sets out to build the Maple Leaf Gardens. But he's a man who knows how to sell a dream. 
He wheedles money from bankers and gets the Eaton's company to sell him the land at a cut rate. The architects work on margin, contractors take partial payment, and many workmen get their wages in Maple Leaf Gardens stock. Con Smythe built an arena at a time when there wasn't the money to build an arena and built it in five months. I mean, just unbelievably how, how all of that could happen. But, you know, he was that kind of brash, proud character. I mean, he was Major Smythe. He was that unstoppable force. In November 1931, the finest indoor arena on the continent opens to a sellout crowd. At the end of his first season in the gardens, Con Smythe gets his revenge. His Toronto Maple Leafs soundly beat the hated New York Rangers and take their first Stanley Cup. But there's something else significant about the game. Suspended high above center ice is a strange steel box. Inside, is a man at a microphone and a future of hockey. It's in the Montreal zone. Up to the blue line, gaining. 